Good evening. Today we have another tribute to a master, Romando Giargola, for whom you will hear from one of the two top scholars who have been knowing, who have known him over these years for today's talk. So I, instead of introducing them, I want to tell you how do they know the great master who was in Australia when he died. Professor Tombesi, I've been talking to him, had visited with a rucksack in Australia, in Canberra, and went to visit the site of his parliament building, and just happened to talk, and they said, architect is here, would you like to meet him? So by accident, as uh, we know that people say uncharted part, like Doshi, by accident, architect was there, and he went and met him. Now, this is between uh, my imagination that an Italian architect from England, an Italian architect from somewhere else, rapport happened quickly. And he invited him, why don't you come and stay in my house since you're a student? And this stay of six days became, over a period of time, a year of working with him and knowing his work in detail. And you will, so, you will see more of his connections and his work at Canberra from his talk. Second is Professor Jemini Mehta, who also does not need introduction in SAP, one of my professors when, when he came to SAP, that was in 75, 76. But he did one of the finest book on Khan's work with Jagola. Now why this is important is that you always come to know somebody not just because you know on a, on a, on a, on a canteen or, or on, a, on a trip, but when you work together, you come to know his ways of working, the philosophy, schools of thought, and so on. Over this period of, of working with Jogola, this working relationship turned into a family relationship, so much so that when Punita went alone to travel and visit Australia, Jogola would take her every day for some concert or some theater or some movie or eating out every day. So what really we are going to hear today are two, one of the two top people who have known Jagola over these years. So thank you very much and we are eager to hear from you. First we start with Professor Jemini Mehta and then we have Professor Tom Basin. Thank you very much. As Nehal just said, this is a tribute to somebody I have known for many, many years. First as a student, as a graduate seminar class on the history of architecture at Penn. Then as a associate in his firm, Mitchell Jergula Architects in Philadelphia. And also as a co-author, I've had a fairly close relationship. In fact, both Paolo and I have been fortunate enough to have known one of the finest architects of the 20th century. Um, it may come as a surprise when I say that because when I say to a lot of people here that I'm going to talk about Romaldo Gergola, I realize not, not that many people really know about him not in this part of the world. Um, <clears throat> and there is a reason for that. A few years ago, Paolo had organized a symposium in Melbourne about his work, and he had titled it The Reluctant Master. It's a very apt title, because Aldo Jargula, I'll always refer to him as Aldo. Uh, those of us who know him closely never called him Romaldo or never called him Mr. Jargula. It was all, always an Aldo, so I will always refer to him as Aldo. But he was fairly, I mean, very aware of what he was doing, 
the impact his work had in the profession of architecture, but he never, never, ever showed any sense of uh, imposing himself on others. He was always very, very humble. And this painting displays that quality very well. It hangs in the National Portrait Gallery of Australia in Canberra, a gallery which has hundreds of portraits of people, of course, politicians, intellectuals, artists, sportsmen, everybody who have contributed in making that nation. And when it was decided to include Aldo's portrait, he was very reluctant because he said, I don't want to have my face so prominently displayed together with all the other people. And it was only when the artist who was commissioned to do so showed him a sketch of something like this in which he is shown very little, but his architecture speaks. That is when he reluctantly again agreed. This is a huge painting. It's about, what, eight feet, nine feet wide in three parts. It dominates one gallery of the uh, museum. But that tells a story about the way a master whose work I will show you and I'll tell you why it is so important for us to know and understand what it was doing. I have chosen to talk about the beginning of his career. Of course, because I am more familiar with that and also in order to establish the kind of work that we almost take it for granted but was not really part of the mainstream architectural vocabulary at that time, he had to struggle a lot. And I have limited myself to that small canvas about five years, three projects. Paolo will have a much larger canvas. He will take you through all the places in the world where Aldo had done some work, but I will limit myself to this. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, how does this work? Let's okay. take it on and you do this yeah, is next. Yeah. This is next. This is next, okay? Yeah. yeah, okay. That is backward. Okay, fine. Thank you. I'm not that tech savvy. Um, <clears throat> in order to understand, although it is necessary to look at the milieu, the context within which he began his career. In the 60s, of the last century. Um, <clears throat> this was America. This was architecture in America. The building here was the first so-called international style skyscraper in Philadelphia, built by George Howe in Las Cas. Aldo was also in Philadelphia he had moved from Rome to uh, Columbia University where he taught and then to Philadelphia when he became an associate professor of architecture. But that was a major introduction of the international style of architecture in the United States. Then during the time of the war, not much was happening, but soon after the war, a lot of things started, like the Lakeshore Drive in Chicago by Mies van der Rohe, and then a little later, what I consider one of the most elegant example of the international style by an American firm of Skidmore Rowing and Merrill, SOM, uh, popularly known, headed by one Mr. Gordon Bunshaft. We'll hear a great deal more about him a little later. But that was what was done in New York. And then, of course, a block away from that building was the Seagram building, done in 1958. And again, coming back to Philadelphia in 64, I am Pies Society Hill Tower, raising a large area of the city, which had buildings like that, three, four story walk up houses, redevelopment was in the air. And a lot of these 
kind of architecture was replaced by that. And that was going on. That was the accepted vocabulary, accepted language with which architecture talked to the society. However, there were murmurs of opposition from that. Uh, not everybody was convinced about that. And uh, there were quite a few young architects on both sides of the Atlantic. On Europe, we had this group of architects, uh, commonly referred to as Team 10. We had Jacob Bakuma from Netherlands, Aldo Van Eyck again from Netherlands, George Scandilis in Paris, then American, oh, sorry, uh, oops, an American architect, Shadrach Wood, who had been working in Paris, Alison and Peter Smithson in London, and Giancarlo Di Carlo in Italy. These were the people who were looking for a new way of doing architecture, who were looking for new vocabularies, and had come up with very good examples of that. On the side of, other side of the Atlantic, we had the Philadelphia School under the direction or the leadership of Louis Kahn, we had George, uh, Robert Geddes, Robert Venturi, and of course, Romaldo Gergula. They were also looking for a different way of doing architecture. So there were a lot of things happening in the 60s. And it just happened that I was lucky enough to be there at that time. I had opportunity to interact with almost everybody at that part of the world. Um, it was at that time that Boston, the city of Boston, had decided to redevelop a large chunk of the downtown Boston. And they had chosen this area, the Quincy area, downtown, middle of the busy downtown area, to be uh, developed. And uh, instead, to construct a civic center, the city government the city town hall and various other facilities uh, to replace this. This is very interesting site for which a national competition was announced and it was participated in by more than 100 arch national architects of the United States. What is important about this is the site. Uh, it is not just that, but look at this building. This is Fenwell Hall. And behind that is the Quincy Market, which is right now one of the most vibrant public spaces in Boston. Somewhat run down at that time. But the Quincy Hall is known as the cradle of liberty. This is where in the 18th century, 1770 time, the Boston Tea Party and all the other things happened. This is where the rebels used to gather and plot the liberation of the United States, which was America at that time. So that has a tremendous historic reference. And to have a site right in front of that gave an immense amount of challenge to the architects. Uh, according to a journalist whom I had talked to, who knew about the competition and what the other entries were, he told me that most of the other entries were similar to the international style glass boxes, office building, uh, and uh, containing all the other kinds of civic center, etc. but following the same language which was prevalent, conventional at that time, except two schemes which departed from that convention. And these were the two schemes. One was by a group of academics teaching at Columbia University, McKinnell, Cannell, and uh, Knowles. Uh, they didn't even have a practice. They did this competition after hours in somebody's basement and, and submitted that. And this was Aldo Jergula's scheme. He was also an academic. He had just started his practice with Urban Mitchell and did this competition together with another architect, Oreland. So these two academicians 
unlike the professional architects, were already looking at different ways of doing architecture in America, which was not the conventional way of doing things. It has always been said, and I have always believed, that the future of the profession is negotiated in the academia, in the schools of architecture, in the studios of architecture. And we quite often do not pay much attention to what is happening in the academia, but this is where new breeze comes in, new ways of doing things is negotiated there. And this is one of the finest examples of that. These two schemes were shortlisted. It shows that the profession and in a competition like this, jury represents the cream of the profession generally. So you can almost assume that the profession has already begun to accept that there's something here that needs to be looked at. Ultimately, it was this that got the first prize. This was given the second prize. And that is also important. For in a competition like this, especially when the two first and second schemes are so similar to each other, and they are. They, unlike the glass um, and, and metal towers, they use concrete, they use brick, they use strong forms, they had a different kind of language. So in a, in a way, while this was uh, more or less like a brutalist architecture, called, quite often described as a version of Le Corbusier's Le Tourette in France, this was also similar in terms of its formal approach. So what was it that made one ahead of the others. I believe at that point, what was rejected as the premium scheme must have been very consciously rejected. Must have been an intense debate between the two. So it's necessary for us to find out, to, or to sort of deliberate as to what may have been the differences between the two that makes the difference between the two. So I've been doing some comparison between the two. And I come up with some very interesting observations. Look at the, uh, the way this uh, building finally has come up. Uh, not dissimilar to the original sketch. This is how it looks. And if you can notice, this is the fan mill hall here. This building actually has a plaza in front. If you look at the site plan, this is the building. and. Uh, this is the plaza in front, which is actually looks at the other side of the fan mill. This is the hall and the market out here. And the entry to this is on that side. So it creates another public space in front of it, but away from the existing historical structure. Uh, this is Aldo's site plan in which he has a C-shaped building containing most of bureaucracy. He separated the two the work area of the bureaucracy and the symbolic area of the assembly, which is here. And he locates it right in front of the Fenwell Hall and the market and creates a place in front, not at the back. There is a public place at the back, but the face is converted here. Also, there is a road going, there is a road here, uh, that road. Aldo makes a point to bridge across the road and uh, meet the fan will hold directly. So this is what is happening. This is the assembly, the symbolic part. This is the bureaucracy, the offices. This is the fan will hall, the road going like that. And he actually bridges across and meets the fan hall directly in front of it. That is the crucial difference between the two schemes. Apart from various other issues about the uh, like both uses brick, the black here is all brick in reality and the concrete. Uh, both schemes had a similar kind of materiality, similar kind of formal uh, resolutions, etc. However, at the level of the site plan, at the level of meeting the city, giving something back to the city and gaining something is where the two schemes radically differed from each other. and. 
obviously the jury chose the other one, not this one. So one can assume that this level of what we call contextuality, and the whole context entered our lexicon only in the 70s. A lot of people began to talk about it, right? This was early 60s, when it was still not part of the consciousness of the profession. This is what my assumption is. So that is where this scheme failed to make any way out. So this is, uh, again, the symbolic assembly here and the related thing. This is the bridge across and the fan mill hall here. And the rest of the things is there. You have a place and you enter the courtyard and the entry is from the courtyard. Uh, not a single door to, to which to enter, which the others came were done. Not badly done, but still there are very crucial differences between the two. And so you have a series of a geometry by which the site actually didn't offer a direct frontal relationship with the hall, with the Fenwell Hall. Aldo went to the extent of using geometry to make the transition from that to this to that to that and then to the Fenwell Hall. So that kind of an effort makes this scheme uh, very conscious of making a place. You have a cradle, sorry. You have a cradle of democracy where the American Revolution began and you have a institution which is a result, a beneficiary of that revolution, a democratic institution to put them in front of each other creates or brings meaning to that place. It's not just a place with physicality. It's not a place with certain kind of material of the floor, the dimension, etc. It is the meaning with which that place is impregnated. That what I call the secular spirituality of the place in architecture. Aldo has been looking for that and you'll see other projects where this has been a consistent, constant concern of Aldo. Not only to make the building as they are, they are fairly good, beautiful buildings, but in the process of making the building, what, how do the order of architecture gains its legitimacy from the very location on which it stands? To give something back to that location and to receive something, to receive that legitimacy from that location makes those buildings anchored on the site. They cannot be taken away and put somewhere else. That kind of a strength constantly exists in all those work, as we'll see as we go along. So you have um, the road is here, bridges across and comes, and this is the Fenwell Hall. As it exists now, Fenwin Hall has a, this is the road, one has to cross the road. These steps actually are besides the building. It doesn't enter directly to the front of the building. It sort of goes around and from the back, you enter this. So you have that and right next to the city hall, those who are familiar with Boston will suddenly remember this or recognize that there's a way of doing it. This is the Quincy Market now. So you have this place. This is, I think, is the heart of the entire project, from where you enter the courtyard. And before you know, you have entered the building without actually entering the rooms. But you are there. And that kind of a way of transiting from the public to the private, the gradation of publicness and the privateness is constantly present. The second project is in Philadelphia. It's right within the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. It's the International House to provide the living spaces for international students who flock to such universities. And uh, it is connected indirectly to the university, was not part of the 
directly administrated by the university kind of thing. So it is at the one corner of the university, Chestnut and 37th Street. And this is the project that won the competition, Bauer and Fredley, a group of <coughs> Philadelphia architects. This is how it looks like. Not a bad building in itself. Fairly, fairly well executed, very well detailed. It sits in the middle of a site and has a front yard and a back, etc., etc. And it makes a good place for international students to be there. However, this is what Aldo proposed. He took a Philadelphia block, a rectangular, sorry, a rectangular block built right up to the edge of the block, which is the logic of the urbanism. Public space is left on the street and created in the process a courtyard within that courtyard. So this is what made the difference between the two schemes. The one stands in the middle of this uh, plot of land. One encloses uh, the land by being on the edge of it and in the process creates a place within both for students also as a part of the offering to the city. And it has an uh, orientation towards the campus, diagonally across where the photographer is on this slide lies the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. So building actually orients itself again being specifically located on that particular piece of land. You cannot move it from here and retain its legitimacy. It had the language, I think, comes from European towns and cities with a parade of houses around a courtyard, around a public space, square. Mm -hmm. um, that scale may have been coming from his memories of European cities, of Rome, etc. But compared to this, which is a Cartesian building, a block of building, self-referential. It could be taken out and built somewhere else if uh, the clients or somebody says, no, we don't like this land, let's put it somewhere three, four blocks away from here, it will still work. That is not the case with Aldo Jergula's building. It has this, and it is a powerful place with a parade of houses enclosing a public square. The third project, uh, unlike the first two, Aldo won this project. This was the first prize project, and yet, for reasons similar to the other two, it was never built. But the story is quite fascinating in this one. Uh, this building actually is, uh, what is known in the Washington DC as the Octagon. It is the third most important historic building after the Capitol and the White House. It was built originally as a residence for a plantation owner designed by Dr. Thornton, the same architect who designed the Capitol. And it was for a while occupied by President Madison while White House was being uh, repaired. And so it has that kind of a history behind it. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, it was given over, acquired by the American Institute of Architects, and has been, since then, the home of the architectural profession. In the 60s, the profession wanted to expand, to have more space for its expanding activities and bought a land behind this building and had a competition announced. 600 plus entries came in. And Aldo Jergula's scheme was unanimously chosen as the best and he was asked to proceed. 
this was the scheme. The octagon and the building with a curved glass wall, living a space in the middle, uh, both new and the old building in a constant dialogue with each other. It was very interesting that the brief of the competition had clearly stated that the objective of the design will have to be to preserve, complement, and enhance the historic residence, and to be an exciting demonstration that fresh and contemporary architecture can live in harmony with fine architecture of another period. Each statement giving the other more meaning and contributing to the delight of the entire building complex. Now, compare that with what the same profession has chosen at Boston. There has been a marked shift in the appreciation of something that exists prior to building the new building and getting into some kind of a relationship between the old and the new. In his statement that contained the entry, Aldo wrote this. The building order develops naturally from the condition of the site, not very dissimilar from that in the Boston site, orienting towards the garden facing the octagon. The building form completed only by its presence. There's no ambiguity about it. It gains because of the presence of octagon. Had it not been for octagon, the building might have been different. So the building order completed only by its presence. The great curved glass wall acts as a foil complementing the octagon. The garden is a quiet place to stay, meeting ground of the historically traditional and the contemporary. This, of course, carried the day, and he won the prize. So why it didn't get uh, built? That lies a very interesting story. Once this was declared as a winner, the profession, the group of architects who were in charge of this project at AIA, decided to expand the program. They decided that while we have this beautiful building, it should be valid enough, last enough, accommodative enough for much longer time. So let's expand the program. Let's make it bigger and have the same architect do it. So and these are the, some of the sketches. He was a beautiful draftsman. Um, and you can see that even while sketching, his focus is on this place in between, not on any of this building, not on the actual uh, form of the building, but what was happening in between. So this was the bigger project he was asked to expand. He did that without losing the primary uh, order, accommodating it slightly. And the original plan became this. Again, you can see in his cage, he was looking at the space in between. The octagon is here, he's looking through. Um, however, at this point, something very interesting happened. Every building in Washington that is done within the historic area, and this was very much an historic area, had to go through a regulatory agency called the Fine Arts Commission. Fine Arts Commission has to approve all the work of architecture, whether it meets certain criteria about being in harmony with not offending any of the historic structure and the fabric of the city. That commission, Fine Arts Commission, consisted of many kind of people, uh, not only uh, politicians, but uh, writers, artists, architects. One of the most vocal member of that commission was none other than Gordon Bunshaft. Remember? S-O-M. He was 
a very, very important member of that. And being an architect, his views carried weight. Now, something else had happened between the Boston competition and this one, and that is that after the Boston competition, before that, nobody knew much about Romaldo Gergula. After that, a lot of things were written about that competition. Comparisons were made in the architectural journals. People were talking about which scheme is better than the other, etc., etc. All kinds of things were happening. A lot of debate. Aldo Jagula's name had become a little more famous than he was earlier. At that time, United Nations had decided to build a school for the children of its di diplomats. And for that, we're looking for architects. And they had shortlisted three architects. Of course, Gordon Banshaw being the most prominent architects, not only in New York, but in the East Coast, was one of the shortlisted architects. I.M. Pei was that. And lo and behold, they decided to have a young upcoming architect like Aldo Jergula. At that point, nobody actually, Bunshaft was reported to have saying he hadn't really known much about Aldo, so, but he didn't pay much attention. He took it for granted the project was his. Apparently, United Nations, people who took the decision decided to give it to Aldo Jargula. And Gordon Bunshaft was livid. For various reasons, which I'm not going to go through, the building never came through. It was shelved, finally. But Gordon Bunshaft remembered Aldo Jergula when he came across this. And he and his committee outright rejected this building. That's not sympathetic to Octagon. It's too domineering, too powerful. It will overshadow Octagon. And therefore, we do not approve of it. As a result, everybody was disappointed. But to save the project, it was decided to give it a try. To see how we can accommodate that, how we can convince the Fine Arts Commission. And lots of schemes were. I was working in that office at that time. Disheartening, one of the most disappointing period in the office. You can see a lot of things were done, but our hearts were not in that project anymore. Aldo's was not there. We were just going through the motions of seeing what can be done so that that project is finally comes through. But this is, these are the kind of things that were happening. This was the final scheme at which uh, also the Finance Commission said, no, we don't approve of this. What they wanted was a quiet background to the octagon, nothing more than that. A nondescript building that doesn't have any presence, it doesn't impose anything, that just stays there as a background for the octagon. For, for them, the octagon was an object, a, a jewel in the crown kind of thing, for which you need a box that doesn't have any other things except to contain it. Aldo will have none of it. So, he resigned the commission. He said, I, I will not do this. Hmm? And a lot of things happened. Architectural journalists were way weighed in into that. Uh, one of the most respected journalists, Stephen, uh, Suzanne Stephen, who later on became the editor of the records, architectural records, <coughs> wrote an article in which she came out and said, uh, about Gordon Banshaft, that yet he, Gordon Banshaft, clearly did not like the building. And he's quoted saying, I think the AIA deserves this. It's a goulash. I think it will not be an architecture, strong words. It will be the freak of 1960s. Very categorical. And then goes on to say that I don't think anything that Jergula does is going to be liked by the Fine Arts Commission. Categorical. It is to do with Aldo Jergula, not architecture. Anything that Aldo Jergula comes up with, they are not going to like it. So you better change this. In a profession 
which we consider we respect very much. Things like this do happen. And so young people be prepared for that. Uh, the president of the American Institute of Architects declared openly that the architect has resigned. And in the, in the statement, he said, it became clear that the differences between the architect and the commission were irreconcilable. Irre what the commission found unacceptable, the architect considered critical to his design concept. And that, while in this instant, Disagreeing with the commission's ruling, architectural profession was divided now. The, the president of the AIA disagreed with the Fine Arts Commission's ruling and said, in this case, we are disagreeing with you. We also, the architect continued to support the principle of design review, which was a politically correct thing to say. Anyway, then, again, yes, Susan Stephen wrote all kinds of things about it, that it ultimately had to do with the clash of ideology, not so much ego as much as ideology. What she writes in this article is that by the time the SOM kind of architecture was at the zenith, the glass box, the self-referential towers, etc., is something that everybody has accepted. But by the time this building came up, this uh, uh, competition came up, the scales had begun to turn and shift in favor of Romaldo Jergula. Hadn't yet quite. And therefore, it never really succeeded. But Aldo never made any, uh, any statement, he quite, quite quiet and continue to work. And as we can see, with, with Paolo will tell you, that what we say in India, Satya Meva Jayante, that is the truth, ultimately succeeds. That is what happened, yeah. Aldo lived to build many other buildings, but all these three buildings display a very clear notion of what architecture's role in the society is, what it has to do in the city besides meeting the expectation and the needs of the client, it has a much greater role to play. There's much more to offer to the society by being in architecture. So that was Aldo's work in the beginning. He had to struggle a lot, but he never wavered. So this is what the building that finally came up. It was designed by the Architects Collaborative, a firm originated by Walter Gropius. And again, as I said, it's a, it, it's a okay building, well executed, well crafted, but it had nothing that Aldo brought to the table. Um, I met Aldo in 2011 when I was in Canberra and he took me on top of the Parliament House which you will hear a great deal more from Paolo. This building is actually dug up in, 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 inside a hill and that the roof is accessible to the people of Australia, Canberra to walk over it. In the process, he has given Australia a place very similar to the place in Boston or at Washington or at Philadelphia. This is a place he created for the people. The idea, he had told me, was that people are above politicians. I will put people on top of the politicians. Politicians are under the feet. And I was told that for a while it succeeded, but then the representatives all become wiser to the idea and they have prohib prohibited that now, uh, claiming security reasons, etc., etc. But when I went there, he insisted on taking me up there and uh, jokingly told me, of course, he could, nobody uh, 
stopped him. The guards were all very respectful, etc. And when we went up there, he laughed and said, Jaimini, enjoy it while it lasts. Those scoundrels are under your feet. You are above them. <laughs> it's not going to last very long, he told me. He said, next time you come, I may not be around to take you up. He was actually conscious that if I came to Canberra again, he may not be around. He left us in 2000, I mean, in last May. I will miss him. You want to take over? <laughs> <laughs>